Welcome to the Life Self Mastery Podcast, where we bring in entrepreneurs who have created online businesses and improved their lifestyles. Here's your host, Rohit Malhotra. Hello, everyone. I'm Rohit from LifeStyleMastery.com. And today we have Craig Bunton, who is a Canadian former pay skater who had represented Canada at the 2006 Winter Olympics. After re- retiring from competitive skating in 2010, Craig had given TEDx talks and became the first student to be accepted to do an MBA at McGill University without an undergraduate degree. Craig is CEO of Sport Logic, which is a pure vision technology company that provides advanced sports analytics to broadcast media and professional teams. Welcome to the show, Craig. Hey, thanks very much for having me. Appreciate it. We have a very interesting journey. So can you please share your journey on why you became a skater and then went on to do MBA and then your own startup? <laughs> uh, why I became a skater? I mean, I was 10 years old when I wanted to initially, I mean, being from Canada and having kids around me playing hockey, uh, the goal was I wanted to learn how to play hockey. I got on the ice. I just really fell in love with it. At 10 years old, I remember telling my mom that I wanted to go to the Olympics. So for me, there was no turning back after that. It was sort of that one big goal and, and chase after that uh, really for the next 20 years. When I retired from skating, it was very much the same thing where it was like, now I'm, you know, my, my late 20s, early 30s going, what am I going to do next? What's my next huge goal? And I really, I mean, when I went into school, I just decided to really just take a leap and take on a challenge that was sort of big, audacious and terrifying. So you competed at Olympics and international competitions. So what's your favorite performance? I think the year we won our first national title was one of the more memorable ones. It was a year that we were really at the end of our ropes. We had given everything that we had that year. We, I mean, financially, we were just completely broken. We knew that we, the training had gone as perfectly as it could. And it was really, we were either going to go in and win or we were going to have to really retire from skating. It was, it was really at that point. I remember the last, rounding the last corner of the ice in that competition in sort of the last 15 seconds of the program, we had skated did really well. And, and as we were coming around the corner, I mean, the, it was a sold out stadium and we started getting a standing ovation before we had even finished our program. It was one of the most incredible experiences of, of my life. But, uh, but yeah, that one, that one really sticks out. How did you get your start in pay skating and whom did you skate with over the years? I was a bit of a rare exception where, uh, I mean, I started pair skating when I was 11 and I, over my career, I had nine different partners. Uh, <laughs> the two that I competed in, in senior with, like at, at the sort of world and Olympic level, my partner was uh, Valerie Marcoux. Together, we were three-time Canadian champions, competed at the Olympics in 06. We were ranked, I think, overall on the world circuit, uh, the third or fourth in 2007. She retired in 07 and basically I had two and a half years with an Olympics upcoming in uh, in our home country to find a new partner. So I found a new partner uh, by the name of Megan Duhamel and we skated together for two and a half years. Uh, we made it up to as high as sixth in the world. And then, yeah, and I, I retired in, in 2010 after that season. So you did your MBA from Matthew University. How did you get accepted for doing an MBA without an undergraduate degree? When I retired, I was 29. I'd been out of school 12 years. I didn't really have too many sort of hopes or aspirations outside of the arena. And I remember waking up the day after retiring and it wasn't, what am I going to do with my life? It's, you know, what am I going to do this morning? I was completely alone and stranded in, in this new world of whatever comes next. I actually did start a small coffee company. I wanted to kind of do something that wasn't going out and applying for a job. And I just basically funded it myself, a small little thing here in Montreal, began building it up. The the goal was to just sort of start my own company. Ended up realizing relatively early on that I knew very little about business. And so I went to McGill initially thinking that I would apply to get maybe do some night courses or something to subsidize the the work that I was doing with my company. And somebody there suggested like, look, why don't you try applying for the MBA program? So they recommended that I take the GMAT and uh, put the application in. I was clear in my application that I didn't really want a job, that I really wanted to run my own company. I did the GMAT, I put the application in and uh, much to my surprise, they, (laughs) they accepted me. Did you sell off your coffee company? I did. Yeah. So I, uh, I, let's just say in the first uh, year and a half, I didn't really sleep that much. I was building that company while doing school. I was in the full-time program at the, at the MBA while uh, and spending, I don't know how many hours a day, pretty much all day, all night working between school and, and the company. I sold that company in 
coming up to sort of midway through the second year in the MBA and basically ended up with a, a semester to do an independent study. I found myself suddenly having finished all of my core courses and having sold my company and suddenly I'm sitting there, okay, I've got one more semester and I want to figure out what I want to do with the rest of my life. I ended up just taking that semester, really just doing an independent study, looking at what I wanted to do next. And the goal with that independent study was I'm going to start a company when I leave the MBA. That company is what is now SportLogic. Why did you think about doing a vision technology company with, with supports, uh, which gives you know, sports analytics to professional teams? There's a long answer and there's a short answer. I'll, I'll try to make this as short as possible. But basically, that the independent study that I did, it was a sort of broad look at new technologies that were coming out, big challenges in the world that need to be solved. I was looking at sort of a few things that were happening, particularly in the automotive industry. I was looking at self-driving vehicles and electric vehicles and the, the impact that those two things would make on the environment and uh, what types of technologies were going into that industry. And one thing that just kept popping up was that computer vision, machine learning, AI, neural networks, there was just this huge wave of technologies, IP and patents being filed. And it was clear that there would be, the next wave would be all of these technologies going into all of the industries around us. And so I kind of walked out of school going, okay, I, I don't know exactly what I want to do, but I know it, it needs to be within this type of technology. And so I, I actually, coming out of school, I, I, the plan wasn't necessarily to start a sport company. That actually came later. The, the plan was really to get involved with computer vision, neural networks, AI, and, and that sort of type of technology. You also got Mark Cuban to invest into your company. So how did you get in touch with Mark? Uh, <laughs> that was actually a cold call. I found his email address on some forum online, uh, and I basically just sent him an email. By the time that I had sent him that email, the company, the idea had been formed and we had been running. We had a little bit of traction. We had filed our first uh, provisional patent. And so we had a little bit of momentum going by the time we actually got in touch with him. But it was clear. I mean, he invests in, in a number of types of companies and he's got a particular interest in sport and AI in, in both of those worlds. So it was, I mean, we really did fit the, the type of investment that he would make. So yeah, so ultimately it was a cold call. <laughs> You have also recently raised a Series A funding of $5 million to build your team. So what are you using these funds for? Uh, well, we're doing a few things. So we really, we started in hockey and we started building the technology, delivering something that wasn't really being delivered in any sport. And that is uh, player tracking in addition to game events. So really think of sports analytics being two types of things. One is tracking. So the location of the players and all the players on the ice, where they are at any given time. And the other being game events or activities, things like passes or shots or line carries or dump-ins. So right now in the world, in order to get player tracking, you've got to put chips on players or put, you know, big bulky hardware in stadiums. And then in order to get events, you actually have hundreds or thousands of people manually tagging video. So our whole, our vision was to, to take those two things and be able to automate them using computer vision. So we came into the NHL and, and we, we began building these these two types of technologies into one product and looking at basically the rest of the world and, and realizing that this type of thing just doesn't exist in sports like basketball or soccer. In our first two years, we, uh, we began working with 23 NHL teams and five major broadcasters. The Series A was really to take that, everything that we've done in hockey, continue to expand and solidify it in addition to making the leap into other sports. So really this round is to get this, the hockey system up real time and move into, uh, into other sports. So how many professional teams are you working with right now? Uh, we're working with 23 uh, NHL teams in addition to uh, five soccer teams in, in various leagues in North America and Europe. So do you get into year-long contracts or how would that happen? The teams are generally signing on for multi-year deals, but the products we're offering and the, uh, I mean, our model is essentially collect all of the data and then productize and monetize across any and all verticals that we can with that data. So we're, we're currently working with the teams for their managers, uh, for their scouts, for their players. I mean, the players have agents. There are a few different ways to slice it and, and, and various models depending on, on who's using the data. Which other sports would you talk about for hockey and soccer? Well, the, from a technical standpoint, hockey, basketball, and soccer are really where where our technology will excel. But we've got to start somewhere. So we, going from hockey right now, we're making the, the step into soccer. Any other company which is in competition with you? Well, yeah, but our approach is different than, than other companies have been. So, of course, I mean, if you're in an industry where there's, where there's no competition, I mean, you're in trouble. It means you're not building something of, of any real value. 
So there are competitors, but um, the competitors, generally speaking, on the tracking side, are putting hardware in stadium. So they're, I mean, they're at a disadvantage because they're it's expensive. So we can scale faster than them on the tracking side. And on the game event side, I mean, we're competing with companies who have again hundreds or thousands of employees uh, in front of computer screens manually tagging videos. Our technology allows overall, I mean, the the efficiency and the ability to scale at least what we've seen in the market. So far, we are by far the uh, able to scale faster and wider than other competitors. And what's the long-term goal for Sports Logic? Well, I mean, we want to be the best sport technology company in the world. As I mentioned, you know, I didn't skate to be the best in the club or in the city, or you know, it was really when when I got on the ice for the very first time, it was I want to be the best in the world. We set that same target and that same expectation here in the office, and you feel that sort of competitive drive when. Uh, you speak to anybody here. For us, we see this technology as really changing the way that sport is analyzed, the way that it's watched, the way that fans experience it. The speed and, you know, breadth and quality of the data is unparalleled compared to where it has been in previous years. So for us, we see this technology as an enabler for teams, for media, for fantasy, for any organization or industry that uses sport data. You have a very unique career from an athlete to a startup founder where you're managing teams, right? So what is the advice to people who go through such sort of a transition? I'm not even sure I can offer advice to anybody. The uh, the road, or at least the path that I've taken or that we've taken as a company, I mean, it's been really, really uh, unique. I, I would say that, you know, in terms of, of athletes in general going into business, I would argue that any competitive athlete is already an entrepreneur. You're really in a position where you're either going to train harder than anybody else and train smarter than anybody else and win, or you're going to lose and (laughs) nobody's going to care. And being an entrepreneur is very much like that. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot on the line with almost every decision that you make on a daily basis. So in terms of athletes going to the entrepreneurship route, I would say dive in, do it. If you've ever wanted to start a company, you've got just try. That said, when it comes to people coming from other walks of life or coming from uh, being students and moving in, I can tell what I did, but I'm hesitant to give advice on what anybody else should do. I think everybody has their own path. And I think personality types are different. Some Somebody might come out like me and want to just sort of blaze a trail and let's go. But the second or third or fourth people who join them are completely different personality types and still as valuable to a startup. So I don't know if there's any sort of broad general advice to give, but I can tell you that (laughs) I absolutely love what I do. Let's quickly do the top three. What's your favorite business book? I've been thinking about this. I've actually been asked it quite a few times. Generally speaking, when it comes to business books, uh, I mean, our our environment is so dynamic that there's very little that I'm picking up from sort of strategic frameworks or standard business thinking. I tend to read books maybe on philosophy and history. I think those are sort of two areas where that are really relevant right now when you look at the state of AI and how quickly our overall environment is changing. So right now I'm reading a lot of Peter Singer as a start. I'm also reading Blockchain Revolution, which is really insightful in terms of what's happening in in that. But business, I don't know if I have a specific favorite business book. If you could go back in time when you started your business, what is the one thing you would have focused on? I probably would have focused on selling product earlier. We put a lot of time into making sure that a lot of pieces of the tech were working. And I think we probably could have gotten away with a cheaper MVP day one. So yeah, get to sale faster. (laughs) This is probably what I would have done. And what's your favorite online tool, for example, Gmail or Slack? Yeah, I use Slack uh, every day, all day, every day with with our team. So that's, uh, I would say right now, definitely. What is the best way people can reach out to you? Either, I mean, email, LinkedIn. I don't really keep my contact info secretive. So um, yeah, it's, you can find me online. Thank you very much for coming on to the show, Craig. I really appreciate it. Likewise. Thanks so much for the time. Thanks for listening to the Life Self Mastery podcast, where we teach you how to start and grow your online business. For more information, visit Rohit's blog at www.lifeselfmastery.com.